Therese and I are both DJs on WFMU, which is a free-form radio station located here in Jersey City. And what is free-form, you may ask? Well, a free-form is a format of radio wherein the, let's just say, most radio stations, what they do is they have program directors, and they tell the DJs what to play. They give you rotation, they'll give you They'll, they'll tell you everything. Either 99 or 100 percent of the programming comes from somewhere else. With WFMU in freeform format, we do all our programming, the individual DJs. In other words, I pick what I want to play, Therese picks what she wants to play. And what that means in, in, pra in practical terms is that we play whatever we want. We're encouraged to be experimental. We're encouraged to mix up genres. We're in we're in, we have a mandate to be experimental, unusual, atypical. And, and we do that as, as, and we've been doing it for a long time. We, WFMU is the longest running freeform station in the US, actually. And not only are we, are we freeform, we're also steadfastly non-commercial. That means unlike a lot of other non-commercial stations, you won't hear this was brought to you by a grant from the Chubb Foundation or anything like that. We don't deal with that stuff. We think it compromises our programming. And we're not part of any public network like NPR or the like. And I think on our upcoming schedule, 100% of our programming will be generated by WFMU. And that's just an amazing thing, I think. And now it's my job to sort of, I'm going to be sort of the talking about WFMU's past, and Therese will be talking about the present, and then later our station manager, Ken Friedman, will tell you about the future and how we're going to get there. We started out in 1958 as a 10-watt station at Uppsala College, which is a liberal arts Lutheran college in East Orange, New Jersey, which is just outside of Newark. And so we got this 10-watt license, and it's just a little thing for some college kids to play with. But in 1962, we went from 10 watts to four, 1440, 1,440 watts. And what happened there was that the government made some miscalculation, and the RCA engineers assigned us that, that power. And that did lead to some border wars with other radio stations in, in the late 80s, and I'll get to that in a bit. WFMU became freeform. Well, part of what happened was the FCC decided that FM and AM should have separate programming, that you can't just repeat your FM programming on AM. So a lot of commercial radio stations like WABC, for example, decided to have different programming on FM. So this became a thing. Freeform became a, a format that actually thrived in commercial radio. And of course, it did the same on non-commercial radio. And this man, Vin Skelsa, has been a, is pretty much a New York radio institution. And he had WFMU's first freeform program called The Closet in 1968. And he was a student at Uppsala College. And what that did was that sort of caused this groundswell at WFMU where a lot of these sort of weird hippie freak types just gravitated to this college, most of whom didn't even attend the college, just the program in this amazing freeform format. And let's just say that it didn't go over well with this, you know, the people in charge of this liberal arts college run by Lutherans. This is Lou D'Antonio, who started out in WFMU in the early 60s and had an amazing freeform program. And in 1969, push came to shove, and the college tried to force the freeformers out. And this is, and if you can play the audio here. It has been a year-long love affair with metropolitan New Jersey, New York listeners, and a year-long battle against grave financial troubles and the owners of the station, Uppsala College in East Orange. The owners, who profess absolutely no knowledge about radio, have refused to understand the message of freeform radio, deciding instead to label the group with the hippie, commie, long hair, rebel, anarchist syndrome. It is clear to the staff of freeform radio 
after a year of hassles, harassments, lies, and power plays by the owners, that to continue and grow at WFMU is an impossibility. Rather than compromise the group standards to meet the demands of the owners who want a nice, bland, harmless radio station, Freeform Radio has decided to cease operation at WFMU on its own terms. Yes, there was essentially a walkout. All the Freeform DJs gave up. They, they just lost the battle. But they didn't lose the war, and that's what's really important to this story. So from 1969 till the mid-70s, WFMU was just this really moribund, boring, album-oriented rock station without with almost no freeform content at all. And then DJs like Erwin Chusid in around 1975 decided to bring back the freeform format and brought in a lot of his friends. For example, there's R. Stevie Moore on the, he's on the right there with Erwin Chusid. And, and they brought in a lot more, more people who had this freeform aesthetic. And it was coming back slowly but surely. And then this man came around in 1985, our station manager, Ken Friedman. And he had a mandate. He said he wanted WFMU to be an all freeform station and to be independent of the college that owned the license. Now, again, we were broadcasting out of a basement studio in, in a dorm at Uppsala College, but there was practically no student involvement in the station at this time, or at the, it was becoming less and less. And then we moved to a house just outside WFMU as part of the Uppsala College campus at 580 Springdale Avenue. And this was our home for about nine years. And in the meantime, the college is going through all this turmoil, and they're really having big financial trouble, and they're not even sure if they're going to survive, to be honest. And with that could go WFMU. So we bought our own license. In 1994, we bought the license, Uppsala closed the next year, and we became an independent radio station. Now, the thing is, it's kind of scary being the only presence on, on a college that's defunct. So here we are in, in a really bad neighborhood with a defunct college where there's like crack smoking in the former dorms, and it's getting kind of scary out there. As you can see here, here are some um, WFMU people visiting the defunct college. So we knew we had to get out of there and get somewhere that could really serve the community that we're broadcasting to. And that's when we moved to Jersey City at 43 Montgomery Street, and we set up home there. This was in 1998, and we've been there ever since, and we've really become a part of what Jersey City means, and, and we're happy to be Jersey City's own radio station. And last, we want to be more, give more to the community, and one of the ways we've done that is we've opened up our own performance space at 43 Montgomery called Monty Hall, because it's, on, it's a hall and it's on Montgomery Street. And we've had performances there, and we will continue to have performances there. And that is pretty much the history and leads up to now with uh, WFMU. And I'd like to bring up Therese Mailer to talk a little more about WFMU. Thank you, Gaylord. So, our college is gone. We're independent. We move to Jersey City. We buy this building at 43 Montgomery Street. And we go from there. So what, what, is, what did WFMU become? It became a station that be, its influence vastly outpaced its, its, out, well, its wattage. So Rolling Stone magazine voted us best radio station in four years running, and then they retired the title. And more and more people started finding the station, and you started seeing its influence in places like Kurt Cobain reading our catalog of curiosities just stopped his unplugged performance just to flip through our catalog. Um, Matt Groening, creator of The Simpsons, huge fan of the station. Artists like Chris Ware, whose um, art is on the cover of The New Yorker this week, 
he, he designed a t-shirt for us. And Danny Hellman, um, Gary Panter, Jersey City's Bob Pirasanti, all of these visual artists help contribute to our aesthetic and really give the station a, a, a visual identity as well as an audio identity. Speaking of our audio identity, the band Yola Tango, every year at our fundraising marathon, they will take requests for pledges. Call them up, whatever you, just show tunes, metal, um, a lot of the kinks, they play the kinks a lot in the Velvet Underground. I think if you did a statistical analysis, you'd find that those two bands are, would you agree, Gaylord? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. Two years ago, they were on tour in Germany. They set up in a room, they, they carved time out of their schedule, time difference be damned, and they did it remotely from Germany, because that's how dedicated they are to the station, and that's how much they care about it. It's not just musicians and artists. We also have hosted politicians, such as the then mayor of Newark, Cory Booker. He called in to the best show on WFMU and during our fundraising marathon, and, and Tom Sharpling, the host, and Cory Booker talked about Newark and politics in Newark and what Cory Booker was doing for Newark. Um, as well as social media and how that actually was what brought Cory Booker to the station that night, just Twitter, because I'm sure you all know how much of an active Twitterer Cory Booker is. But then we took it in a different direction and we had Cory Booker answer Star Trek trivia with John Hodgman. Ma Mayor yeah. Cory Booker, I will ask you, what is the name of Captain Sisko's son? Wow, Captain Cisco, Deep Space Nine. Um, what is the name of his son? Yes. I have completely forgotten the name of his know. son. I, I mean, I like Quark. The interesting <laughs> Middle East parallel mm -hmm. uh, between the Kardashians and the Bajorans. Yeah, um, you've established uh, your cred, Mr. Uh, Mayor. But I cannot <laughs> remember the name okay. of Cisco's. See, that's a good de that's a good debating technique. When right. you don't know the answer, you say you talk about all the other issues around it. Well, what about right. the Bajoran play to the Bajorans? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Okay. I think we're talking about the wrong thing. No, Why nobody, are we talking about control of the wormhole? Nobody knows his name. It is Jake. 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 Yeah. Oh. You're gonna give me the first letter, man. Okay. I would have gotten it. You should give me a clue. Former New York mayor and now New Jersey senator Cory Booker. Mayor Fulop, if you're still here, if you ever. Aspirations on higher office, you want to talk about Battlestar Galactica, Doctor Who, whatever, give us a call. So in addition to our FM signal, we also, we broadcast on the web. We have been on the internet since 2009, no, since the 90s. We've been archiving all of our, all of our programming since 2001, lives on our website, and you can listen to any of it. In 2007, we became the first radio station to have its own iPhone app and an Android app followed in 2010. To show how easy this is to use, my aunt called me or texted me, which was like, what, Aunt Mary Ellen, is everything okay? She texted me from the car, she was riding in with my mother to say that they were listening to an archive of, of my show, which was just really great. Um, so technology, that's all well and good, but I think what, what comes down to is, is we're a community. We're a community of people who are there because we, we, we love it and maybe we don't fit in anywhere else. Um, we all volunteer DJs, engineers, nobody gets paid. And it just, it, it enables us to make a, like a personal connection with our listeners and I think a really excellent example of one of our DJs who makes a deep personal connection with our listeners is, is Glenn Jones, a host of the Glenn Jones radio program on Sunday afternoons with X-Ray Burns. He, in 2001, Memorial Day weekend, he somehow convinced station manager Ken Friedman to let him try to break the Guinness Book of World Records record for the longest radio broadcast, which at the time I think was 75 hours. He went for 100 hours. It was crazy. He, he, we had members of his fan club 
the International Brotherhood of Jones, or the IBJ, as they are known. They were camping out in our parking lot. They were, people were coming in. Vince Skelseth came by. He hadn't been in the station in how many years? He came by to support us. It was just a really beautiful expression of our community and how much people get out of this. And then that's Glenn Jones on the Today Show after, after the broadcast, well, after he had taken a nap and cleaned himself up. Gotta look nice for television. So we're a community of listeners and DJs, but we're also part, even though we're not part of a, of a national public radio organization or a college, we're still part of community radio. And one of the ways that we showed that was Democracy Now!, a program that airs on WBAI. In 2001, due to some WBAI-esque stuff, <laughs> it's really kind of hard to figure out how... Anyway, they were off the air. We took them in. They became Democracy Now! in exile. And we ran Amy Goodman's program until that was all sorted out. In 2005, when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans and radio station WWOZ, which is a wonderful jazz station in New Orleans, just fabulous, they, they're in New Orleans, there's their building. You can see the roof is gone. I mean, it was, we, we streamed their programming so people could still hear the station even though the station couldn't broadcast from New Orleans, which brings us to two years ago, Hurricane Sandy. Um, Hurricane Sandy hit a week before our scheduled record fair. We were at, well, I was at the station. I tried to leave, and this is a series of text messages I exchanged with station manager Ken. You can see the water had come up to the east and the west of us on Montgomery Street. That white blotch in the middle of all the blue, that's us, and that's water all around. The Hudson River came up almost to our doorstep. We lost our signal. We were able to keep our web, we lost our web signal, but our website stayed up, and every program, the majority of programs, have a listener comments board that runs live along with the show. The comments board ran all night. People were just, people were checking in. People were, are we okay? What are we doing? Hang in there. People were donating money. Stations off the air. It's like we almost don't even need a radio station. Well, we do. <laughs> um, but our community, our community was there for us and they were incredibly loyal and incredibly, incredibly generous because that, not only did our, did our physical plant sustain about $100,000 worth of damage, we also couldn't have our record fair that year, which is one of the, aside from listener contributions, one of the only ways that we make any money, as Gaylord said, no underwriting, no commercials, no corporate sponsorship. So we usually bring in about $150,000 from our record fair. That's gone. Uh, we, our record fair is in Chelsea. Chelsea has no electricity. New York City has just been hit by this super storm. The record fair is probably the least of, in the grand scheme, the least of everyone's problems. But for us, it was huge, $150,000, plus $100,000 worth of damage to our equipment. So that's a quarter of a million dollars that we are out, down. Our operating budget is less than $2 million a year. So that's, that's huge. That's an eighth of our budget. Did I do the math right? Yeah, no? Anyway, so, but yeah, our listeners were there. They were giving us, they, they were pledging money. They were, they never, they never abandoned us. And the next day, we had a, one of our DJ, former DJs lives, moved to Pennsylvania to Pittsburgh. He, he started, he got a web stream up, started broadcasting from Pittsburgh. Station manager Ken, Erwin Chusid, they, cobbled together a studio in one of our volunteers. One of our volunteers let them into his home, cobbled together a studio in his kitchen so they could start broadcasting online. It's amazing what our listeners will do for us and our volunteers will do for us. They, they know that, it's, that we're all in it together, that it's, 
it's us. It's radio done by humans. And that I think is, that I think is the best freeform definition of any. Like, it's humans playing music, speaking, programming what they want. And it makes a connection with the listener. And now with, well, let me back up a little bit. We do, we have our FM signal, 91.1 here. It broadcasts from East Orange. You can get that here in Jersey City. We also have a repeater station, Mount Hope, New York, at 90.1. And another Rockland County, 91.9. So we do have FM coverage, but within that, it's sometimes easier to listen online. And we broadcast online as well through our website, WFMU.org. Web listening has taken over FM listening. Um, it's a three to one ratio, web to FM now. But that, you might think that, oh, well, they're everywhere. You know, it's not, it, it, it ceases to become about a community. 70% of the people who listen online are listening online within our FM range. So, and then it's a 20% other, uh, other places in America, 10% international. So that kind of spreads us out. But we're coming back to Monty Hall, our ground floor space, where we can now bring the local community in. We can, we can invite them over. And that's where we're at. Thanks.